Hi, everyone. Welcome to Answer in the Call. This is the official podcast of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. My name is Larry Calderoni. I'm the president of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association here alongside with our legislative director, Jamie Keneally. This week, Jamie and I will be discussing how the BPPA works on the behalf of our members and their families. We'll then tackle some of the biggest issues affecting the membership in both the State House and out on the street. And for those of you who are not in uniform, the general public, I'll be answering your toughest questions about policing every day. Nothing is off limits. I stress that nothing is off limits. If you want to ask a question of your police department or the union organization, you should know that we will answer those on every podcast. We'll make it a point to answer your questions thoroughly, and you'll see how we answer the calls for service every day for the general public. So please be involved. All right, everybody, welcome to the official uh, podcast of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. My name is Jamie Keneally, alongside Larry Calderoni, the president of the BPPA. This is it, everybody. This is our first show. This is podcast number one. And I'd like to, or we'd like to, if we can, get to a couple of things. We want to talk about collective bargaining, and we also want to talk about the fact that right now, as we speak, the Boston Police Department, men and women of the BPD, are working without a contract. So collective bargaining, no contract, big issues. Before we get to those, let's introduce El Presidente. Sounds great, Jamie. I love it. (laughs) Larry, excited to be working with you as always. Um, I I want people at home to know a little bit about you. So police work, when did you get on? How long have you been a police officer for? I've been a police officer approximately 20 years going on 29, excuse me, 28 years going on 29, Jamie. Uh, I haven't stage fright, as you can see. You look good for a guy who's been on that long. Keep going. Thanks, buddy. Um, So i I. I was hired in 1994. Uh, Previous to that, I was a police cadet for a couple of years, 92 to 94. Uh, 94, graduated from the police academy, was assigned to B2 in Roxbury, did a short time in B2, B3, which is the Mattapan section of the city. Moved over to the motorcycle unit in special operations. Uh, Spent a a good half a dozen years or so there from uh, special operations. I moved out to West Roxbury, uh, area E5, and, and I've been out there for the remainder of my career until I... Started working full-time as the legislative director at the Patrolmen's Association, moving on to the vice president and now the president. I got to tell a quick story because you were the auto guy out in West Roxbury. And I got to say, Larry touched me personally uh, because you used to put the kid seats in for the cars. I did. And and when I had my first son, Keegan James Cadilly, who's now 12, you showed up at the house. Wife was crazy nervous. You came up, showed up with the seat, installed the seat. And little stuff that I think you've done over your career made a huge impression on me. I know because I'm a police officer as well. But you've done stuff like that throughout your career. That is true. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I want to ask you the question, what is police work for you? What drew you to police work? And, and, and how do you make a difference in this profession? Well, how you make a difference in the profession is uh, open to opinion. There's so many different aspects of policing that officers can do daily. But for me, what drew me to the profession was about helping others. I, I grew up in a big family in Jamaica Plain in Boston. It was always about looking out for one another. It, we grew up in a neighborhood that acted the same way. Yeah. Neighbors looked yep. out for People everyone. Everybody grew up together. So for me, it's about helping others. So 28 years, you took the job to make a difference, help people. Do you still feel the same way about the job 28 years later? Well, the job has changed, most definitely. And and I'm sure regardless of whether or not you have been on five years or 28 years, uh, the job consistently is changing. But has it been great for me? Yeah. Yeah, But the the helping people piece to it, do you feel like you could, is that still a part of it? Do you have that sense of satisfaction? Is that something you you still feel 28 years in? Because obviously over time, you can get a little jaded, yada, yada. But do you feel like, hey, the opportunity to make a difference and help is still there for a lot of Absolutely. I'm actually more satisfied with the job today than I was when I first started. And why? What? How come? Because I found over the life of my career thus far, there's always an opportunity to help someone out. There's always a way to come to work and make somebody feel better about themselves. You mentioned my auto guy days. Uh, when I was the crash investigator in West Roxbury, many a time I would have positive outcomes and positive dealings with teenagers, young drivers yes. who make mistakes who are looking for discretion, consideration, and compassion. Uh, And that's something that I I take uh, great pride in. I want somebody to know that police officers are out there every day looking to help people, 
looking to let people know that we are there for them. It's not all all about chasing down bad guys, locking them up and throwing them in prison like you see on TV. It's about helping people daily, and that's what we do. To your point, I couldn't agree with you more. It's kind of like this thing people don't seem to understand about police officers, but helping people, cutting folks a a, a break, showing some empathy, forgiveness. I know when I first got on, my trading officer said, when you pull somebody over— Look for, speaking of, you know, child safety seats, look for child safety seats in the back of the car. I said, why? He said, you might have a mother, you know, on her way to whatever the appointment is, got a couple of kids, you know, blows through the red light. Do you want to hit her with a huge ticket or say, hey, ma'am, do me a favor. I know you get kids, even though they may not be in the car, drive a little bit slower. All right. So 28 years of police officer. Yeah, you're now the president of the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association. I'm curious, you know, what what brought you to that position and why did you run for it and uh, why is it an important job? I've always had the knack since I was a teenager, Jamie, of wanting to help others, speak for others, stand up for others. And uh, when I joined the police department, you know, we, at that time we were 2,000 members strong at 10, 12 various districts throughout the city. Different shifts, different officers, different needs, wants, and complaints. What um, working conditions in West Roxbury uh, could be different than the working conditions on the other side of the water in East Boston. Uh, So you need a voice to speak up with you. And when you get to a collective group within the union, uh, each monthly meeting is where you try to hash these things out. Officers in West Roxbury have different needs and wants than they do in East Boston. All right. So in that position, you're standing up for fighting for, advocating for, your members, the the police officers. Uh, what what are some of the bigger issues that 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 your members want to see addressed, or what are some of the things you've worked on that are that have made a difference? Well, I got to tell you, the biggest the biggest issue for members uh, on a daily basis, they want to talk about the bargaining, collective bargaining. They want to know about their contract. They want to know about their wages. They want to know what benefits are coming to them and their families. Because just like any other profession, you need to be able to earn an income and have that income satisfy the needs of your family, whether you're talking about private school, taxes, cars, vacations, everything that goes with uh, being a well-developed family is a concern to the officer. So obviously, yeah, you live in one of the most expensive cities in America. Your police officers need to get paid. You mentioned collective bargaining. That's a term that we want to address in the show. People, you hear that term a lot. I, I think so much so that people don't even know what the heck it means. Collective bargaining, break it down for us. What is collective bargaining and why is it important? It's important because that is what provides for the men and women that we represent. So let me try to make it more simplistic. Collective bargaining. The collective is the membership. You have a president, you have a bargaining team. It's formulated through your union representatives. Uh, They are bargaining collectively with the city as they represent the men and women on the street that are answering the calls for service or performing in the daily functions of a police officer. If you belong to the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association, you have myself, the vice president, and your bargaining team sitting down to negotiate with the city for better wages, better working conditions, and better benefits for our members. All right, so the collective is you. You're speaking on behalf of the collective, the you know, uh, thousands of police officers. What are we, 1,600 now? Yeah, approximately 1,600. Okay. So right the collective, now. you're speaking on behalf of them collectively. And when you sit down to bargain, and we're talking about no contract, is that the biggest issue that you're sitting down to bargain? The fact that um, the, your members are right now without a contract? That is correct. Yes, right now we've been without a contract. It'll be two years this come July 1st. And members are starting to get antsy. We understand there was COVID. We understand there was a change in uh, mayors over the last couple of years. Uh, But, you know, right now, Mayor Wu has been in office, uh, took over in January. And we're hopeful to get this bargaining session moving very quickly. Uh, Stupid question, but your officers are deserving of a raise? Every day. Okay. And what is, how do you determine a fair wage? What does that look like? What is that that bargain or that negotiated deal going to look like? What are you shooting for? What are you trying to do? Well, I can't get into numbers of what we're shooting for here, uh, but the membership is well aware of what is on the table from our side. Uh, We did share that openly with the House of Reps and the membership. um, So they have an idea of what we're asking for. But how do you determine what's fair? It's a cost of living. And when you look at what the cost of living increases are in private industry, and then you look at the public industry as well, you look at other police organizations of your size and your commonwealth, you look at the firefighters on the other side of the aisle, our brothers and sisters in public service, and you try to get to a median of what those pay increases in percentages have been for others and naturally 
that is what we would be looking for. So comparative analysis, you're, see, you're seeing what others are being paid and obviously you want to be paid like them. That's correct. Okay. Um, let me ask you a silly, just silly question off the cuff. To those who say cops, police officers make too much money, is that is that a valid criticism? No, it's not. Uh, are there police officers that earn a very good living? Sure, there are. We see them. They're printed in the Globe and the Herald every single year. And it's more to point a finger to say, hey, look at these guys that are making a tremendous amount of money. But the reality is those officers that are making that money, they're earning it. Right. And they're earning it by working 80 to 90 hours a week. And what many of the general public don't seem to understand is a lot of that is forced over time. Fair enough. But I want you to kind of drill down on the 80 to 90. People seem to gloss over that. They don't seem to understand that police officers, yeah, it looks like they're making a lot of dough, but they're literally working 80 to 90 hours a week. That's correct. And l let me try to flip the script a little bit because you can never get a, an honest, I shouldn't say never, but it is very difficult to get an honest print in the newspaper on this topic, uh, which is why I'm valuing this type of uh, media that we're doing now, this podcast. Yeah. We, we want the general public to understand that we understand it looks bad in the newspaper if a police officer makes uh, a large amount of money. We, we get that. But what's not being addressed is the amount of hours it takes to make that money. So without using any, without disparaging any other profession, if you're in a profession and you're paid $110,000 a year for a 40-hour work week, and you want to make $220,000 a year, you can by all means go outside, get another 40-hour week yep. position, yep. work 80 hours a week and make 220. Yep. So if a police officer is making 220 so at 80 you. hours a week, yep. so can you. So that, can that's exactly citizen. where yep. I'm Couldn't trying to go with this. Yep, thank and, you. Yeah. And, and here's the thing too. Good luck trying to live in the city of Boston own a home at $110,000 a year. One well, of the most expensive cities in America. And your, our members, your officers... Our officers have a residency requirement. They have to live in the city for 10 years. Good luck trying to buy a home in Boston where the median, I think, price for a home is up, you know, around 800000 bucks. Here's the, here's the answer. You can't do it. That's the reality of it. You, you, earn, earning a family income um, for a family of four, we'll use a basic family yep. of four. If, if your earnings are $110,000 a year, you're not buying a home in the city of Boston. And that's the truth of it. And when we talk about what it costs to, to bring up a family in the city, the costs are astronomical. And police officers deserve a raise. They deserve to be treated like the common citizen wants to be treated, with respect, paid their worth, have the ability to earn a good, comfortable living, send their kids to school, take them on vacation, and provide a roof over their head. It's the common expectation of every citizen in Boston, right. whether you're a police officer or a school teacher or any other profession, we all want the same thing and it's the best for our family. So in answer to the question, do cops make too much money? Absolutely not. Not. That's correct. My, that's my answer. Yeah. Collective bargaining, though, I want to, I want to drill down on that a little bit more. Um, and, 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 you know, looking at the mayor's website, if it's okay by you, sure. she says on the website that collective bargaining is to blame for wasteful overtime spending. I'd like to have that conversation further with the mayor. Uh, obviously, I do not agree with that um, statement. I'd like to know where she's coming from with that, because uh, when, when I analyze the, the budget, and by no means am I an accountant, but it sounds like we're just passing the buck. It sounds like some nonsense to me. Uh, right now, if you want to talk about the ADA money coming out of Washington, the city of Boston is flush with cash. There's plenty of money to do things, as we've seen Mayor Wu already do when it comes to housing and taking care of some of the issues down at Mass and Cass. Uh, there is money available. So taking money from the police department's budget to put it somewhere else and blame the greedy police officers or blame the unions and collective bargaining. That's exactly the point. Yeah, that, that's, yep. that's a falsehood. That's yep. smoke and mirrors. That's just politics at its finest. The reality is... There is plenty of money to go around, and if you properly fund your police budget, you won't have overages. If you properly manage your police budget, you won't have issues with going over budget. So said another way, when you hear elected officials, and I think they call it a false equivalency, when they say, if only we paid police officers less, we could fund important social programs, or we could pay other city employees more— how do you react and respond to that? It, that's complete nonsense. I mean, that that's smoke and mirrors by by good politicians. 
How do you get the general public support to move money from one budget to another? You point blame. And that's exactly what's gone on for too long of a time. It, the reality is the police department's budget is over budget year after year because it's not properly funded. If you properly funded the police department, you wouldn't be in the red every year. And taking money from the police budget to fund another avenue, again, I find that insulting. And the men and women on the street find that insulting. The city of Boston has plenty of tax revenue. They have plenty of money from the ADA in Washington. The mayor's been doing her job down at Mass and yep. Cass. She's providing housing with it. She's building parks. Uh, I, I will give her credit for, for the things that she has done in the short time she's been in office with the money. But I will not stand by and have her say that if we just took some money from the police department, we'd be able to fund other mm -hmm. programs. Because the reality is you can take money from many different avenues, and it doesn't need to be the police department. What you should be doing is properly funding the police department, not taking money away. But when you hear the elected officials say, if only you took money away from the Boston Police Department, what, you, you know what's coming next. And again, how, how angry does that make you when you hear an elected official start a sentence with, if only you took money away from the cops? Again, it's pure, it's pure politics. It's grandstanding. Our, our members can't stand hearing it. it it's, it's just a non-truth is exactly what it is. For, uh, for an elected official to stand upstairs and, uh, excuse me, stand outside and point blame and say, if we just took money away from the greedy cops, that is nonsense. That is made to infuriate the general public. It insinuates in a roundabout way that we're all overpaid and we need to take a pay cut. That is, again, absolute nonsense. Distracting from real issues and giving the general public something to be mad at. Let's be mad at the cops who make too much money. It's easy to point your finger across the street and blame somebody else. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, contracts. Again, uh, referring to her website, the mayor says um, that she would make regular updates about the timeline for contract negotiations. Where are you guys? Or where Where is the union right now with the contract? Uh, we will be without a contract at the end of June 30th. We'll have been out two years without a contract. Okay, no contract as of June 30th for two years. Correct. Uh, issue there, problem there? What's How do you feel about that? Well, it's a huge problem. And, and um, you know, I don't mind being here on the record you know, I pride myself on being honest and open, and we're going to answer some questions down the end. But uh, when it comes to being without a contract, the men and women on the street understand we just got through COVID. We understand we're on our third mayor in the last year. You know, Mayor Walsh had moved on, Mayor Janey took over, Mayor Wu is now elected. We understand all that. But now Mayor Wu has been in office for going into May, four solid months. She's putting her team together. There's a new labor relations director the time has come to get meetings set forth. The time is to get to the bargaining table now and let's hammer out a deal. We should not be going three, four, five years without a contract, which I have seen in my career with various other mayors. That cannot happen here. So could I ask, have there been meetings? With Mayor Wu's staff, no. Uh, but as I said, I, I recognize she's been in office for a short time. I recognize that just recently in the last couple of weeks, she has a new director of labor relations. Uh, the BPPA has sent a demand to bargain letter to the new labor relations director. We have been in contact with the mayor herself and her chiefs of staff. Uh, we are working on getting dates, hopefully at the end of this month of May, early June. What we would like to do from the BPPA standpoint is get back to where we were with Mayor Walsh. I like and I'm, and I'm somewhat uh, encouraged by what the mayor has on her webpage. It like she'd like to streamline the process mm -hmm. and have it more timely. So I applaud Mayor Wu for that. I hope she follows through with it. Let's see some action. Yeah, we, actions speak louder than words. Let's get to the table. We should have a meeting once a month on collective bargaining. And I recognize there's 20 odd unions that are without a contract as well, but there's average in 30, 31 days a month. So there's plenty of time for the city to schedule negotiations, even if it's once a month, once every five weeks. We should be getting to the table with the Wood administration very quickly. Okay, switching gears, Larry, City Councilor Kendra Lara wants to take away police details. And, and I got to tell you, um, this just sounds like a really, really bad idea. W what's your take? It's a ridiculous idea, Jamie. Um, it, you know, you're being nice by saying it's a bad idea. Uh, we have a new city councilor who clearly does not understand the benefits of having armed uniformed police officers uh, with mass general law capabilities on the street 
day and night throughout the city of Boston. We have approximately two to 300 uniform men and women out there providing a free service to the citizens of Boston while being paid by independent contractors who want the police officer at that site. They don't want the civilian flagger. They want a police officer that can protect their workers at the same time, provide the visual deterrent for possible crime that might happen, and be able to respond to any situation on the street yeah, emergency that, whatever um, yeah. incident yeah. person in need of help so let me i, I got it i'm sorry i got to elaborate and drill down on this go ahead free police and i know there's people on the other side say, yeah, this thing is free police it, it is essentially just that we're talking about free police officers is that an overstatement or is that accurate no that's an accurate statement and I'm sure when local media personnel listen to this podcast, they're going to start printing all kinds of stories uh, with inaccuracies about how, I don't know, Eversource is going to decrease your monthly bill by a dollar and 12 cents a month. If we just got rid of police details, there is no public or independent private industry that is going to cut your bill monthly by getting rid of a service out on the street. It's just ridiculous. So again, taxpayer money, they're not paying for the details. And you already said it, but please just say it again. Who's paying for the police details? The company, the construction company that decides to put a hole in the middle of the street or in the sidewalk or creates the inconvenience? Who pays for the police details? The independent contractor that requests the detail to be there. Perfect. All right, so she wants to take away details from police officers. Who, who does she propose or who does she think, who is she trying to give these jobs away to? Well, I'm not going to get into her written ordinance because uh, essentially she wants to create a new bureaucracy in her own words. She wants to create a new office independently run by the city of Boston with an operating annual budget in the tens of millions of dollars. Let me say that again. The city will pay tens of millions of dollars to create a new bureaucracy to run a detail system that's currently run by the police department. So I, I got to ask you then, where is the cost savings? Because I would imagine that would be a big piece of her argument that if you get rid of the cops and you hire civilian flaggers, you're going to save the taxpayer money, even though they don't pay for details. It, it, where, where, is, where is the cost savings? There is no cost savings. In fact, I don't even know if Council Alara is proposing a cost savings. Um, l looking and reading her proposed ordinance, it's it's about creating a, a multi-million dollar agency within the city of Boston, specifically aimed at taking away police officers' details on the road, which, again, I'm going to stress to you, provides an irreplaceable benefit to the citizens of Boston for free. But yet, the new councilor wants to spend tens of millions of dollars to create a new agency run by the city of Boston. I it's, mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, slap in the face all day long, but I, I, I got to say it again. So you got the perfect, the perfect partnership between public sector, private sector, private sector. We found a way to get the private sector to pay for more police officers. You literally essentially have free police officers in the city of Boston, and she wants to blow this system up. Can I ask? I, I would imagine... The membership, the officer in the street who's working 80, 90 hours a week, uh, how how insulted or angry are they uh, upon seeing this, the the proposed or the request for, for such a hearing? Angry is probably an understatement, Jamie, on your part. I know you're being nice, but uh, I'm going to go on still professionally, I think. They're furious. It's a complete insult. To, to the men and women that show up to work every day. You, you know, a, after the marathon bomb and after 9-11, after all of these horrible tr tragedies that take place, police officers get patted on the back, uh, and it goes away very quickly. What the elected officials should be saying is thank you. They, she should be saying, thank you, officers, for picking up this extra job day and night. Thank you for spending time away from your family and providing the service to the citizens of Boston. Because the truth is, while they're out there, they're responding to calls for service, whether it be the bank robbery in High Park that was foiled by a police officer, whether it's the person at the end of the road suffering from a medical condition and the police officer rushing to the scene in a matter of seconds, as opposed to... I don't know, a civilian flagger that has no capability to do anything. 
I, I don't think the council has taken into consideration the great benefits that police officers, men and women in uniform, provide to the city of Boston every day. So she wants to literally pay more for less. Correct. And you, you touched on, or I think you touched on the prevailing rate. Civilian flagger, are they going to get paid less than the police officer? No, Jamie, they're not. Let, let me just give you a quick a quick view of how ridiculous her statements are. And I know I, I know I'm kind of going after the counselor on this, but what the counselor should have done, uh, being homework. the new counselor, has done some homework, correct. Should have talked to her more experienced peers in the council, maybe reached out to the biggest police union uh, here in the, pretty much the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think we're second to only the Mass State Police. Um, but if she had just sat down and had a conversation, we could have done something like this. The, the new tens of million dollars system that she wants to start in the city of Boston is going to have to be a prevailing wage job, as she recognizes. Prevailing wages right now in the Commonwealth of Mass, hey, a carpenter's prevailing wage is somewhere around $82 an hour. I think electricians are around $90 an hour. Painters are around $82 an hour. So you're talking about going from a police officer on the street providing an, an irreplaceable service for free to the citizens of Boston are now going to start paying civilians that can provide none of the services that a police officer can uh, for $90 an hour, for $82 an hour. It, it's ridiculous. It's it's grandstanding. It, it's something that uh, many elected officials prior to the councilor have thrown on the floor only to realize once they start digging into it, it's preposterous to think that they would create a new bureaucracy and take uniforms off the street. Yeah, it's an, it's an indisputable insult to the hardworking men and women of the Boston Police Department, no question. Let me just ask you, ask you some quick questions, because if we're going to do this comparison, flagger, police officer. So can a flagger write a ticket? No. Can a flagger make an arrest? No. Can a flagger, if God forbid someone's in the midst of a health emergency, having a heart attack, seizure, fill in the blank, can a flagger cue his radio and call for EMS or, or, or backup? No, they can't because they don't have radios, Jamie, and, and it is extremely unlikely. I'm going to go a step further. It's extremely unlikely that that civilian flagger is certified in CPR or any type of first responder certification. Are they going to save that person's life? At the intersection? No, they're not. If a car decides to speed through a construction zone, blow off the flagger, God forbid the speeding car strikes a pedestrian, can the flagger help save that that individual's life? No, it's, it's basically the same. It's a no, no, they cannot, Jamie. And, and you know what we have reports of in other parts of the country when we talk to our union brothers and sisters uh, nationwide is we have continued complaints of civilian flaggers Damage in motor vehicles that they don't see stopping in a timely fashion, uh, using abusive language, uh, destroying uh, private property uh, for the vehicles going. They're by. not it's, trained professionals. Yeah. They don't understand how to resolve conflict. Things police officers do literally every single day. I mean, d can a civilian flagger deter a crime? No, they cannot. And, and really, here's the big thing, and you've already touched on it. But how do flaggers make the city of Boston safer? They don't make the city of Boston safer, Jamie. And that's that's what I've been saying through this last 10-minute diatribe here, is that the city of Boston has the benefit of two to 300 uniformed police officers, armed police officers on the street every day of the year. They're responding to calls for service that a flagger cannot. They're making arrests at bank robberies that a flagger cannot. They're saving lives medically that a flagger is most unlikely to be able to do. Uh, you, you know, one of one of the council's statements is that we're the last or one of the last states in the country uh, to civilianize flaggers. Yeah, she's correct. And we should be proud of that. That's not something that uh, we should look at as, oh my God, we're the last. We should be proud of the fact that we have uniformed men and women out there saving lives, deterring crime, making arrests on horrible situations. And luckily, that bank robbery I keep referring to in High Park, um, luckily nobody was killed. And we're going to give all the credit in the world to the police officers that responded to that call. The fact that more states aren't doing what we're doing, given the model, 
public sector, private sector, free police, added safety. I mean, essentially, she's recommending to uh, she her recommendation is to make the city less safe. Is, is it just that simple? Because that's exactly what will happen if you decide to replace police officers with civilian flaggers. I believe the council is just grandstanding. I, I, I think that she's, um, you know, she's taken her win. Congratulations to the win uh, as the new city council. We look forward to working with her in a more professional, realistic uh, manner moving forward. Uh, but I, I think it's just grandstanding. Uh, I think when she really looks into the nuts and bolts of what's provided to the citizens of Boston that, by the way, she's elected to represent, mm-hmm. she's going to realize that um, by trying to dismantle the system, for whatever her reasons are, uh, it is a actually a hindrance to the citizens of Boston. It is something that will hurt the city, that will make the city less safe if you replace police officers out on the road. All right, as, as we always do, we're going to end, end uh, you know, our podcast with the Ask Larry segment. Really cool segment. And if you have questions for Larry, please, again, I'm going to give you the email address. Uh, please send questions to answering the call at bppa.org. Again, answering the call at bppa.org. Uh, the question this time around, Larry, is as follows. When cops break the law or police officers break the law, why does it seem like they aren't subject to the same punishments as the rest of us? Are our police above the law? Um, that's a funny question, Larry. Actually, it's a great question. And it's a good question for our, for our uh, inaugural show. So I'm going to answer it as, that is perception, and that is maybe what is out there in your local newspaper rhetoric on your um, talk radio shows, depending where you listen to. But police officers are actually held to a higher standard than the general public. And when you look at officers that are charged with a crime or breaking the law or some type of offense, more often than not, they're held to a higher standard. They're actually judged differently than the general public. And, and I kind of have an issue with that in, at certain times because we want everyone to be treated equally and fairly. Um, police officers, it's easy to point the finger at them and say, look at that guy, he'd get off because he was a policeman. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, are there times when the, our judicial system doesn't work to the liking of everyone in the Commonwealth? Of course. There are issues that I have with, with different outcomes as well. But to answer that as thoroughly as I possibly can, as you just heard, uh, that is not true. Police officers, more often than not, are treated more harshly than the general public. So why do people think that? It's easy to think Perception, that. It's, like it's, you it's said, it's newspaper, it's, media reports, yada, yeah, yada. It, it's so much easier to change direction from or change focus from what might be going on that day in the general public or that might be going on in the media. It's easy to... to change the story and change people's focus. And unfortunately, police officers have been under attack for the better half of the last decade or so. It's easy to point the finger at at a police officer and say, look at what that officer did. He should have known better. Uh, You know, unfortunately, that's the day and age that we're living in. I've seen plenty of police officers uh, get punished and be reprimanded, yada, yada, yada. But anyway, all right, that's going to wrap up this episode of Answering the Call. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the podcast, please uh, send it to uh, the following email address, answeringthecall at bppa.org. Again, that email address, answeringthecall, one word, at bppa.org. Okay, for more information about the BPPA, Uh, Go to our website, bppa.org, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Boston Patrolman, as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, That's it. I'm Jamie Keneally. He's Larry Calderoni. Stay safe out there, everybody, and thank you for listening.